So I'm going to go ahead and pray for us and get us started. And then um, if anybody else joins us, then that's, that's great. Look, I've got a full screen of faces tonight. This is pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to pray. Father God, thank you so much for this evening, for the opportunity to dig into your word a little bit, to look at something that might be a creative way of hearing from you, a way for digging uh, for treasure, a way of just um, being excited, Lord, in, the, in your word as we let your word richly dwell within us. And so I pray that, Lord, this will be something that will inspire us, that will challenge us. I pray that it will um, accomplish what you desire. You say your word never returns to you empty without accomplishing what you desire. And so we pray that for this evening. And I pray that you'd bless our time, that you would be honored in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Here comes Maricela. I'm going to, that's great. Good to see you. Ha ha, Maricela. <laughs> oh, yay, Jennifer's on. Hi, Jennifer. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and put us on share screen because you know how to share picture. And. Give me a second here. Okay. Um, where's my slideshow? There we go. Okay. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Good. I love to share pictures, as many of you know. And so it kind of makes it fun to have this um, to kind of help communicate a point or visualize God's word. So uh, tonight, the, the um, presentation is called Three Things I Pray. And it's, it's uh, just, again, another tool, another way of just helping you abide in Christ. It's a way of seeking to discover him through what you can experience with your senses, with your emotions, with your imagination, with creativity, with a look toward hidden treasure that God might have in his word, uh, abiding in him and letting his word abide in us. Uh, it's not the only way to look for God. It is not a required way to look for God. Uh, I always like to say, this is just a treasure to uncover. It's a gift from God in his word that can stir our hearts and maybe stir our curiosity. So I always tell people, you don't have to do this. Um, there's no rules. Um, just another idea for you. So what you need tonight are your Bible and the handout, hopefully. Um, Sydney and Kim, did I send you guys a handout? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, I've got a handout that you can kind of follow along with. I hope I left enough space for you to jot some notes down and some fill in the blanks to keep you kind of on track with where I'm at. Um, and that's really all you need for tonight, um, unless you want to have some extra paper on hand to take some notes if you run out of space. You know, like just like you're going to be writing so much tonight, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Ready? Okay. Three things I pray. I wanted to just take a minute to talk about the power of three. Um, I don't know if you've noticed or realized that um, maybe when you're out and about in the world, when you notice the messages, the slogans, the headlines that you see in the paper, advertisements on billboards, how many of them use uh, groups of keywords? groups of three phrases, groups of three. If you've been in communication for any length of time, you've no doubt come across the rule of three. I don't know if you've heard about it before. You might probably know about it even if you haven't heard about it. <laughs> rule of three. This rule of three suggests that words grouped into three are more appealing and easier to remember. Isn't that interesting? Our, our brains are pattern-seeking machines. I did not know this, that our brains are wired to seek out patterns and they're constantly looking for relationships and meaning in the world around us. So three is the smallest number we need to create a pattern. More than one or two, three creates a pattern. It's the perfect combination of brevity and rhythm. 
I got all this, all these big words from an article I read. But um, according to one author, a speechwriter, and an author of a book called Lend Me Your Ears, studies show that listeners will wait for a speaker to find a third item in a list before taking their turn to speak. Isn't that interesting? I'll give you a chance to say three things before I'm done listening to you and I want to speak. If you start to share a fourth thing, it's I'm done, I'm going to share, I'm going to interrupt. I did not know that. I'm going to pay attention to that from now on. The third item marks a sense of completeness. And we have an ingrained tendency to wait for it. Now you're all going to want to start watching and listening, huh? I know I am. Pastors, I, don't, I know I was taught when I prepare a message or to teach an outline, I was taught to prepare a three-point outline. And I guess that's what this, what, that's what that's for. That's why. Because people look for three points, three things, three words. I, as an example, here's some famous quotes. How about, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. You heard that from William Shakespeare? Or how about, um, Abraham Lincoln's speech of uh, a government for the people, I'm sorry, government of the people, by the people, for the people. If he had only said of the people and by the people, we would have felt like something was missing. Isn't that interesting? How about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence? Can you think of any others? Can you think of quotes or phrases or famous lines that have three items in them? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Can you think of groups of three? I was trying to think today and I remembered you know, how realtors say, it's always about location, location, location. <laughs> I thought that's cheating, but it's three things, right? How about the Trinity? <laughs> yeah. The, oh, hey, you're stealing my thunder. That's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> you're stealing my thunder. It's going to be one of my slides. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're going to find out the Bible has lots of threes in it. The idea of three is a principle that's captured neatly by this Latin phrase. So I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it correctly, but it's omni trium perfectum which means everything, uh, everything that comes in threes is perfect. Omni trium perfectum, or every set of three is complete. Isn't uh, faith, hope, and love in 1 Corinthians? Yep. Lots the greatest of, of these is love. Lots of biblical examples. And I, 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 uh, I put this quote on the screen because this is just the world has gotten this idea. You know, the Bible has it, the Bible uses it, but the world in so many different ways in communication and advertising has gotten this idea too. Three is the smallest number. We need to create a pattern, the perfect combination of brevity and rhythm. And I've also found that it's true visually. If any of you are decorators or you want to create a pleasing, um, visual display, you'll know that displays of three items look much more balanced and more finished and more complete than displays of two. People always tell me, put group things in threes, threes or um, odd numbered multiples thereafter. There's something about, so when you just look at two items, it kind of looks like there's something missing, like something should be on the other side of that jar of apples. But when you've got three items, you feel, oh, that's, that's complete. I don't know why, but there it is. It's a reality. So what about three-sided objects? Yeah. Triangles. Yep. Yep. Pleasing to the eye, balanced. That's right. So the number three has a significance in a spiritual context as well. This is where I'm leading. Three in the Bible, and actually in the Hebrew language, represents wholeness, completion, sufficiency. 
So we're going to see lots of patterns of three in the Bible. When I first started thinking about the idea of looking for these groupings of three in the Bible, or praying for groups of three, praying for three things, um, a number of years ago, actually, this song that I have here, this song was the first one that came to my mind. You may have heard this. I don't know if any of you saw the musical Godspell back in the 1970s, a, um, a, a musical a theater production about Jesus and about his followers was extremely modernized. And one of the songs in the musical was called Day by Day. And the words to the song, and really, I, I listened to the song again today, and that these are all the words. They just sing them over and over and over again. <laughs> But I loved it. Um, day by day, day by day, oh dear Lord, three things I pray. To see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. And besides being a great song, it just feels right, doesn't it? It feels like that's complete. It feels like, okay, those, are the, those three things will just are everything I want to do with God. I don't know why. If I had only said two things, I might have thought there's got to be more. So thinking about what it looks like, like to find threes in the Bible, to pray threes in the Bible, not as a rule, not as now you got to do it this way all the time, but just as a way of stretching us and multiplying the ways that we pray, multiplying our praise, multiplying our worship and how we follow Jesus. Um, can be just a creative way to look for him. So I went on a journey uh, a while back looking for a, a treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. Sydney will laugh at this because Sydney's in a in part of a small group that I lead of young women that we spent, oh gosh, I don't know, maybe six months one time just doing treasure hunts in the Bible and looking for treasure in God's word. And so I love the idea of a treasure hunt. And I found some treasures that I'm going to share with you tonight. I'm just basically what I'm going to do tonight is give you a whole bunch of examples that um, you can take away and use to flesh out a quiet time. I discovered um, great opportunities to pray for the things that are important to God. Because I think one of the things we're going to discover is that sometimes three represents the fact that this is significant, this is important. God needs us to remember this. This is a transformational moment. So I'll show you some of those things. In fact, what's really bizarre is even this morning when I was having my own quiet time, I was reading in a passage of scripture and I found a pattern of three. And it fit perfectly with what I'm going to share tonight. And I was like, thank you, God. He gave me this little extra piece to put into the message today. So I'll share that with you later. Um, but as we go, I'll give you verses and I'll give you a kind of a, a library of things that you can go back and use and look up yourself. Okay. All right. So let's start on your note sheet. Um, we're going to look at several different categories of way we see patterns of three. And the first one is the revelation of God. So yes, the Trinity. Um, you might say the foundation of our treasure hunt for threes is the Trinity, the biggest all-encompassing all thing there is, right? The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one. And so the first thing we might do in our treasure hunt for threes is spend some time with the Trinity and understanding the, you, the characteristics of God is expressed in each of these different natures of God. So I like to talk about um, God as Father, God as Son, and God as Holy Spirit, and spend a little time figuring out what are the unique contributions that you, each of those bring to their relationship with me. What is it like for me to be part of the 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 love at the center of the, of the triune God. What is it like for me to experience that joy that exists between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So we might start with pursuing um, an understanding of the nature and characteristics of God here. So let me give you another little picture of the Trinity. I thought this was cool. 
this is kind of an explanation of how the three are one and yet unique. So you've got God, and God in the center is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not the Father, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? And so suddenly we realize there's a new way to look at God. There's a new way to explore and understand him. So here are a couple of questions you might ask yourself if you were going to spend a quiet time just focusing on the Trinity. Here's what you might ask yourself. Okay. Um, what unique characteristic does the Holy Spirit bring to my relationship with God? And then I would ask that same question of the Father and the Son. What unique characteristic does the Holy Spirit bring to my relationship with God? What unique characteristic does the Father bring? What unique characteristic does the Son bring? And then off the top of my head, I was playing around with this and I thought if I were gonna have my quiet time on this, the first things that come to my mind are, well, I remember in Romans 8, that the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. The Holy Spirit intercedes in, with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit, when I pray, he empowers my prayers. And oh, I might want to spend some time on that. And then I thought about how the, the Bible says that the Son is our advocate. He sits at the right hand of the Father and he's our advocate. And he defends us and he, and he represents us to God the Father. And so what might that be like? How might I pray thinking about the nature of the Son? How might I pray thinking about the nature of the Holy Spirit? And God the Father, of course, um, loves us. He hears us. He reaches down from heaven. He rejoices over us with shouts of joy. The, the God the Father knows the time when he will send his Son to come and get us. God the Father gives his good gifts to us. So ask yourself, how can I relate to each of these characteristics of God? How would I pray knowing these characteristics of God? What might I pray? What might I ask for? Now let me give you just a few more verses. We're not going to go too far into these, but here are some verses you could look up if you wanted to spend some time thinking about how God reveals himself in threes. 1 Samuel 3.8. Just write the verse reference down. 1 Samuel 3.8. That's when God called to Samuel three times when he was about to call Samuel into service for him. How about Acts 10.16? When... God spoke to Peter in a vision, and he gave him the same vision three times. And he dropped down a sheet from heaven, and he commanded Peter to eat what was on the sheet. And what about John 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. It was his way of revealing himself to us. There's some great verses, and I'm just saying, take each one of those and do an exploration of the three that you see in those verses. What would you pray? What would you ask for? What would you want to know? Here's one more that I just discovered the other day that I thought was fascinating. Did you know that God only spoke audibly, out loud, where more than one person could hear him, three times in the New Testament? Can anybody think of, of any of those times? Three times when he spoke out loud where more than one person heard him in the New Testament. In the New Testament, when Jesus was, uh, when Jesus was baptized, he yeah. said, um, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Yes. You win, Althea. <laughs> There's that. That's the first time. Can you think of the two? Anybody think of the other two times? Well, would it be Paul on the way to Damascus? But that was not God. That was 
Jesus. So that's right. That good guess, though. Good guess. Does that matter? <laughs> it's not the it's one I'm not, looking for. He's God. <laughs> when he died on the cross, didn't God talk to him then? Uh, I don't believe he did. I don't think so, no. But you're thinking in the right. So at, at the baptism of Christ, God spoke. And then when Jesus was transfigured, remember, God appeared in a cloud and he said, this is, again, he said, this is my beloved, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And the third time was right before the Passover, right before the, the last supper. And Jesus told his disciples that the time had come for him to glorify the father and uh and he said um you know i take i i lay my life down and uh god said and 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 jesus prayed in that moment father glorify your name and mm -hmm. god responded out loud i have both glorified it and will glorify it again so three times and so what a great thing to focus on in a quiet time three times when God audibly spoke. Why three times? Every time it involved Jesus, didn't it? Isn't that interesting? So just looking at the revelation of God, of who he is and what he calls us to do and what he wants from us um, and who he is in his nature. Three, look for threes. So here's, those are some great verses for you. Those are some great ideas, some ways you could do the, uh, look into the revelation of God. Okay, next thing, the timing of God. <laughs> I love this. How many of you have ever said this in your life? Count to three. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we say that? What causes us to say, I'm going to count to three? So they have time to... I don't know, join in or something. <laughs> give, give them a chance. <laughs> You're going in the right direction of what I was thinking, Althea. Yeah, who do we say that to? Well, you warn children with that. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You yes. Kids. You're waiting for them to obey or to show they're listening to. Yeah, yeah. We say that to our kids. I tend to think that we say it in love because we really don't want to punish our kids we want to give them every chance to do the right oh. thing, right and all the experts and all the child psychologists will say you should not do that right. you should not do that right. say it once and they need to respond immediately but i think the reason that we as moms do it is because we do we we just we want to give our kids the chance to do what's right we want them to succeed right so I wonder when God says something three times or when God waits a certain, for three days or three years or three something, I wonder if he's giving us the opportunity to um, do what's right or to respond to him. So here's a great example of somebody waiting for three days. And that was Esther. Do you remember what, oh, she, what Esther did for three days? Prayed. <laughs> yeah. Prayed and fasted. She asked her people to fast for three days before she went in to face the king and to ask for his mercy on behalf of her people. That was Esther 416. So there's an example of three. I'm amazed when I started digging in, I was amazed how many examples of three. So here's some questions you might ask. Here's a, a, a way you could spend, pr find three things to ask God and three things to pray. Um, here's a great question. In this particular example of Esther being, telling her people to wait to fast for three days, what might happen in three days? You know, if I do something for three days, if I wait three days before acting, if I pray for three days, what might happen? You calm down. What? You calm down if you're angry. Yeah, absolutely. Or the problem will go away. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give God time to act. Um, give God time to change a person's heart. All kinds of things, right? So what might happen as if, if we wait three days or if we um, do something three times? It's interesting to me that those three days could signify uh, maybe um, allowing God to complete a preparation. Maybe God's completing a preparation of maybe the king's heart, my heart, the prayer's part, heart. Maybe um, waiting three days could signify the patience that I need to develop. I need, maybe I need to develop patience. Or maybe I need to remember that I have to 100% totally depend on God. If I act too soon, I could be acting in my own strength. I could be acting on my own desires, my own will. But if I wait, maybe it gives me time to recognize I need to let God go first. Here's a... Um, and, and then, you know, if you wait three days or if you pray three days, how might you pray? If I'm going to pray for three days, how might I pray? I might mm -hmm. pray um, out loud on my knees. I might pray with my eyes closed or open. I might pray um, on my face. I remember listening to a... Uh, conference given by Beth Moore one time and she was talking and she's this very exuberant um extroverted very demonstrative person and she told us in this lecture that I heard that she gave that every single morning she gets up to have her quiet time she goes out to the kitchen she gets her cup of coffee she walks outside to her patio and she lays prostrate on the ground face down arms spread out just in total complete surrender and submission to God. And that's how she starts her morning. And I thought, wow, that could be really um, humbling and significant, a, a posture of humility and submission and surrender. I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. So how might you pray if you were going to pray for three days? How might it look different on each day? Those are some just some great questions to ask yourself and to consider when you think of three things to pray or three ways to pray or three days to pray. Here, let me give you a list of some other verses you could look up that have to do with the idea of threes in God's timing. Matthew 12, 40. Matthew 12, 40 tells us Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale. Jesus was three days in the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 tells us Jesus was resurrected from the dead on the third day. Acts 9.9, 9, Saul was blinded for three days after meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. Genesis 22.4, I had not remembered this one. It was on the third day of Abraham's journey that he came upon Mount Moriah and prepared to sacrifice his son. I actually have, I came across a whole page long list of incidences of things happening on the third day in the Bible. If you want it, I'd be happy to send it to you, but I printed it out and I thought I'm gonna tuck it away as a resource for what the significance of things in the Bible happening on the third day. So there would be a whole list of great ways to spend your time in the word. You know, what are some significant things that happened on the third day in people's lives in the Bible? Okay. All right. The next pattern of threes that I saw in the Bible was um, kind of, I lumped these together. The treasures of God and the lessons of God often come in threes. And the first one that I came across was 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that says, so now... Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And I thought, wow, what a great treasure of three things God's given us. Faith, hope, and love. I found this symbol. I think, I'm going to have to go back and ask, 
I think my sister, who's very conservative, very um, tame, um, although she's very extroverted, my sister Jackie, um, she, she got a tattoo on her arm. I was shocked and so surprised. I never dreamed my sister would get a tattoo. I think it's this. I think that it's this. And because I looked at that and I thought, I remembered seeing on her arm, there's like the little heartbeat measure. Um, and I thought that was the coolest symbol. Faith, the cross and hope, kind of like the beat of our heart and love. And so you could spend time in the word thinking about this treasure trove of three that God has given us. And here are some questions you could ask. Okay. Why is love the greatest? Um, what happens to faith and hope in eternity? Wouldn't that be a great question to ask of God? It's, it's uh, well, it would be completed. Hope is completed. We don't need to hope because we're there. Yeah. And same thing with faith. I mean, yeah. we're right there in God's presence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we're with God in his presence, all we'll need is love, right? Right, right. And then maybe another question to ask, how do these three treasures abide in me? Which one's the strongest in me? Which one's the weakest? What would I pray? How would I ask God for something? Or how would I pray regarding faith? hope, and love in my own life. Wouldn't that be a cool way to spend a quiet time? Just talking to God about his treasure set of three things that he has given us, faith, hope, and love. So here's the cool um, connection thing that happened to me today, my quiet time. I came across, as I was reading my just assigned reading for the day in Hebrews 10, I found a pattern of three. And it just so happened to do, have to do with faith, hope, and love. And I thought, oh, wow, this is so cool. I'd never noticed this before. But here's something. If I wanted to talk, pray, and ask God to show me some, some wisdom about faith, hope, and love, and then if I wanted some lessons to learn or some action items, here's what I could do is Hebrews 10. I call this the lettuce wedge. You know how when you go to the restaurant and you get a salad and you order a lettuce wedge, and it's shaped kind of like a slice of pie? It's kind of like a triangle shape three sides. Well, there's this lettuce wedge in Hebrews 10. Um, the reason I call it the lettuce wedge is because it's three um, instructions that start with the words, let us. And so in Hebrews 10, you're going to look at verses 22, 23, and 24. And they say, first, let us draw near with a, a true heart in full assurance of faith. And then 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. And then verse 24 says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good deeds. Isn't God amazing? How he brings together these, you know, faith, hope, and love seem to go together in, in more places than one in his word. Yeah. So... Now you've got three more things to pray. God, how could I do this? Show me how to draw near in full assurance of faith. What would that look like for me? Show me how to hold fast. And here's another thing. For those of you that are willing to get a little bolder in your creativity, you know, Sydney, you know that I love to uh, draw little illustrations or find pictures or images. Well, what would it look like? How would you draw yourself drawing near or holding fast? or stirring up. Those aren't super hard images to draw, or maybe you just find a picture, and, and maybe you let it kind of imprint on you. Think of yourself drawing near, holding fast, and stirring up one another. What would that look like? How would it feel? How does it move you? What does it require of, as an action? I get all excited thinking about all this because these all these little pieces come together. Mm -hmm. So there's a great quiet time for you to have using God's three treasures and his three lessons. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a few other verses just to add to your list that you could go back to. Hebrews 9, 4. 
says that there were three treasures in the Ark of the Covenant. Does anybody remember what they were? Debbie, we can't hear you. <laughs> and I bet you have the answer. Um, manna in a bowl, the tablets, and Aaron's broken staff. Excellent. Yeah. Wow. Imagine how you could spend a quiet time with those three treasures. What were those? What? What were those? What did God want to reveal to us with those three things? What was he saying to us about himself, about his promises, this treasure of three? What lessons did the people of Israel learn from the, the manna, the staff, and the, and the tablet of commands? What lessons exist in those for us? How about John 21, 15, where, um, where we learn that um, Peter had denied Jesus three times. And so then Jesus tells Peter three times to feed my sheep. He asks John, uh, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Three times he says that. Why might that have happened? Why might have Jesus said that three times? What would Jesus maybe want to tell me three times? What do I need to hear three times? How about Ecclesiastes 4.9? A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Treasures that God's given us that you could spend time meditating on, drawing pictures of, illustrating, identifying, and then praying. What three things can I pray about? Okay. One more, uh, one more section here. Um, Mm. examples of how people prayed in threes mm. examples of how people prayed in threes and i just found these pictures i wanted to kind of illustrate the maybe the emotion i guess uh when we see examples of people in the bible praying three times it might be good to ask some questions like what were they praying for why did they pray three times how did they pray? Um, and then how could that reflect onto the way we approach God? So again, we aren't looking for hard and fast rules. We're not saying you're required to pray for something three times and only three times. It's more of a, I think it's more of a attitude, a, a purpose, um, it's an idea of intentionality, maybe, commitment, intensity. Um, it might be really good to spend some time asking God, what was the significance of these instances where people prayed three times? So here's the, the, the big one, Matthew 26, 44, where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we are told that he prayed three times that um, God would remove the cup from him. 2644? 2644. Okay. Three times Jesus prayed that God would remove the cup. And then he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. There's a whole bunch to unpack in there, isn't there? What have I asked God to spare me from? And have I ever at the end said, but not my will, yours, Lord? Or have I meant it when I said that? Did I mean it? I, I might have said it, but I really still wanted him to remove the cup. What would it look like for me to pray those things? And you might consider three things when you, when you look at a passage like this. Consider the heart of the prayer. Consider the need. And consider the posture of the prayer. What do you learn when someone does something three times, you get a chance to really consider their heart, their need, and their posture. So, of course, these pictures, that one in the top left is representing Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, you know, and we're told that he was so anxious and he was so um, distressed that he, he um, sweat drops of blood. And so there's this intensity, isn't there? And what might we learn from this example of praying three times? Perhaps um, 
you know, what is our level of intensity? What is our, what is our heart position when we approach God? What's our need? Do we believe that God holds the answer? Do, also, um, I wonder if, because three is the idea of completeness and wholeness and sufficiency, do you suppose that maybe in a situation like this, praying three times indicated that God is sufficient? His answer is sufficient. This is a complete request, and it's enough. Maybe. Maybe there's a lesson in here of looking at people who prayed three times in the idea of persistence. You know, do we give up too soon? So here's some other verses to consider. Daniel 6.10. <laughs> Peter prayed. I'm, I'm sorry. Daniel prayed three times a day. Even when he was threatened, right? Even when it was made against the law and he was threatened with death, he prayed three times a day. Psalm 55, 17, David wrote, morning, evening, and at noon, I will pray. I will pour out my complaints to you. Mm. What was that verse again? That was Psalm 55, 17. Or how about 2 Corinthians 12, 8? Paul prayed three times for the thorn to be removed. This just fascinates me. When you start digging and you see how many times these patterns come up in scripture, patterns of three, I just feel like it's worth spending some time digging into them. Mm. It's worth exploring why they're there. Mm. Any questions about that part? Any questions about the, the idea of praying? Um, and looking at people who prayed for things three times or prayed three times a day. So the top right picture, that's, I think that's, a, that was the best I could do at finding a picture of Paul <laughs> and uh, asking for God to remove the thorn. And the one on the bottom, bottom corner is my best attempt at finding a picture of Daniel praying three times a day, even when it wasn't allowed even when it might have been painful to pray or scary to pray. You know, because I liked these pictures because they all had a sense of purpose, focus, intentionality. Okay. One last thought about this whole idea of threes. Besides mm -hmm. being a way to uncover treasure or to understand God, and to understand, to maybe pursue and explore his trinity, besides being a way of um, considering that these might be extra important things if God felt like he needed to say them three times, and besides reminding us to pray repeatedly and to trust in the sufficiency of God's word, besides all that, for me, looking for threes means I'm doing, I can do better than just one thing when I'm in God's word. I can do better than just finding one thing, writing one thing, writing down one thought, reading one verse. You know, I can do better. And that there are multiple ways I can seek God and pray every time I get into his word. I don't have to stop after finding one thing to write about. I can dig for more. So that helps me, looking for threes helps me to take it the next step, to go one more step and then one more. <laughs> so your takeaway, now that I've just given you this treasure trove of verses, I was going to give you a handout that I had put together, actually the handout that's in the banquet book. It's called Three Things I Pray, and it takes you all, it just asks a bunch of questions about um, the story in Luke where Jesus was tempted three times. And I give you, I have you look for the three temptations, the three responses, the three things that he had to do without in the desert, and maybe more. Um, three ways you could pray, uh, things like that. I was going to give you this template and just have you follow through, but I thought, 
that's just so quick and easy. And I'm giving you all the outline and giving you almost giving away the things to find. And so I thought, you know what, I've just given you, I don't know what, probably 20 verses or more um, that talk about threes. And maybe God's just going to put on your heart something to pick up and take and do with your next quiet time. Um, and really, if, if the thing that motivates you most is to think, this just takes me beyond one thing, maybe that's worth it. Or if you're like me and you enjoy a treasure hunt and you want to, now you want to go and start finding all the examples of threes in the Bible that you can find. Trust me, you can Google search examples of three in the Bible or, you know, uh, third day examples or three times in the Bible. And there are just dozens and dozens. And if you think about it as being complete and whole and sufficient, you know, I have to take this as a whole picture to be complete. I have to get the three. I have to take all three. Can't just say Jesus is the way without saying he's the truth and the life. Can't say, just say God is the father without saying he's the son and the Holy spirit. So it, it, it challenges us to take the next step. So your, your takeaway is to pick one of those verses or more and just explore it. Do your quiet time, finding the three, um, asking yourself some of one or more of those questions I gave you and praying three things, finding at least three things to pray for yourself and for your own spiritual growth and for your own understanding of God's word. And then I love this. I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you can't contain. Now God longs to be gracious to us and he waits on high to have compassion on us. We just have to, we just have to dig. So thoughts, questions, responses, opinions. <laughs> I was thinking about our, can you hear me? Yes. I was thinking about our patriotic song, My Country, Tis of Thee. Um, probably most people know the first verse more. And it's in those threes. And I, now I realize one of the reasons why I liked it, I had to memorize it when I was six and sing it for my teacher at school. And it starts off, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. And it has a lot of threes in it. And I just started thinking about it while you were talking and I hadn't really realized that before. And the man who wrote it was a clergyman, Reverend Smith. He wrote it in 1832. And um, I just wonder if he didn't know about all of these threes when he was writing it with his background. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I was I was just thinking about the phrase a triple threat. Oh, yeah, there you go. That just occurred to me. A triple threat. I mean, we we can, you can be. I that that's a you know when you're talking about trying to motivate people, and the power of of choices you make in terms to motivate to get people moving and going. And I, I'm just thinking of the Trinity as a triple threat. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, but a, tri a triple threat is actually the way you look at your adversary at your, or at your competition. You evaluate them according to the strengths. And when you call somebody a triple threat, they bring, that means they're bringing three very powerful gifts or to, to the competition, to the contest. And it implies, anyway, you could go, you could go ways with that. I yeah. just thought I'd offer that. That's interesting. Very interesting. I bet you're gonna start noticing threes now. <laughs> In your TV commercials, um, watch for sermon outlines, listen for the pastor's sermon outlines you know, or examples in scripture. And uh, it just gives us a sense of satisfaction to have three things. <laughs> yes, that's right. Who said that? Was, that? was that Bonnie? I did. Yes, that's right, Bonnie. 
Review, uh, review, review. Yeah. yeah. Guess who's heard that before? Review, review. <laughs> Love you, Bonnie. Well, <laughs> do you feel like this is something that you could see yourself using in your quiet time? Does this intrigue yep. you to pursue, to look a little further into? It's fun. Mm -hmm. I even, um, let's see, I'll show you on the, so I even, one suggestion I had um, was after you have, uh, after you've made, a, uh, come up with three things to pray, maybe it's going to be, maybe you would come up with three things to pray that here are three things I'm going to do, Lord. That would be really great because that's an application, right? I found out this about you, Jesus, you're the way, the truth, and the life. Um, I'm going to come up with three ways to acknowledge that and embrace that. So maybe you come up with three things. I like to, I even like to, and I do this sometimes when I'm taking sermon notes, draw a little picture that kind of cements it in my brain. So um, for example, when I did the exercise on looking at Luke and the three temptations that Jesus faced, and one of the temptations was because he was hungry. And so he was tempted, right, um, um, that, to turn the stones into bread. And um, so his temptation was hunger. And I thought about um, that temptation and how, what hunger does to us. And, and uh, I, I, one of my prayers that I committed to God on that particular time was that, Lord, I will go to your word first today before I satisfy my hunger. Mm. And so then I did this little symbol to remind me of that. <laughs> If you can see it, a little picture of no food. <laughs> and I thought, you know, you could kind of, if you wanted to be creative, because images stick in our heads better than words. So if you even wanted to go back through, and if you came up with three things to pray, you know, what are, what, what three things, even like those on, on that lettuce example, you know, thinking about what is draw a picture of holding fast or um, stirring up, um, and, and, you know, what would that look like? And I do that all the time in sermons when the pastor's speaking and I'm identifying his three-point outline. And then I just draw like a cross or a, a heart or whatever that represents that thought. And it helps me remember visually what I heard. So there's an idea too. Okay, well, we actually finished up about five minutes early tonight. So 